Welcome to the University of Colorado Denver College of Liberal Arts and Sciences series Conversations About COVID. I am Marjorie Levine Clark and I'm a professor of history and associate dean for diversity outreach and initiatives in the college and you've probably become familiar with me moderating series about COVID-19. Um, and some of you may have attended our series last summer, COVID-19 Colorado and beyond. We really didn't know what we were in for at that point. Who knew we would still be wondering whether we would need masks, whether it was safe to gather with strangers in restaurants or to ride public transportation. I saw in the New York Times today that our 14 day change in new cases is up 109%. Um, most likely that's because of the Delta variant. Um, we really can't pretend that we're over the pandemic. Um, the remaining three sessions of this interdisciplinary series this month will help us understand where we are now and where we are going as we continue to negotiate the stages of this pandemic. All the lectures will be recorded and made available on the CLAS YouTube channel after they're presented. And I think Tracy Combe is going to put the link in the chat. For Zoom etiquette, please keep yourself on mute for the duration of the program. If you have questions, please use the chat feature to answer, ask the questions. Um, if we wind up a small enough group at the end, we can um, ask questions by raising hands um, and I'll try to get to as many questions as possible after the lecture. I want to thank our outstanding faculty who volunteered their time for this series. I also want to thank Tracy Combe, our CLAS Marketing and Communications Director, Tim Stalker, the CLAS Webmaster, and Kristen Salisbury, the Program Manager for CLAS Continuing and Professional Education for all their help on the technical side of putting their, this series together. So our speaker today is Laurel Hartley, uh, who is an associate professor in the Department of Integrative Biology downtown um, on our campus here. She's also a CU, Pre CU President's Teaching Scholar. Um, that's a system-wide honor. She does research in both infectious disease ecology and in science education. She has studied disease ecology of bubonic plague in prairie dogs and teaches a course in infectious disease ecology. She also does research related to how people understand and interpret concepts, biological concepts like evolution. Today, Dr. Hartley will talk about the emergence of SARS-CoV-2 from non-human animals and the subsequent evolution of the virus during the pandemic. She will interweave fundamental concepts of evolution and how misunderstandings about evolution may impact interpretation of emergence of variants of SARS-CoV-2. Her lecture is titled, Origins and Evolutions of SARS-CoV-2, What Have We Learned? Why does it matter? Welcome, Dr. Hartley. Thank you, Marjorie. I'm gonna cover four main ideas during this talk. The first is how do we track evolution of variants of the SARS-CoV-2 pathogen? What is a variant of concern? How does evolution of variants work? And why does all of this matter in terms of what we can do to save lives and in the pandemic? So let's start with the first question of how do we track evolution of variants of the SARS-CoV-2 pathogen. So first things first, SARS-CoV-2 is a single-stranded positive sense RNA virus in the family of coronaviruses. Um, one common misconception that my first year biology students sometimes have is that everything has DNA. When in reality, not everything has DNA. Some viruses are RNA viruses. Um, SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus, influenza viruses are RNA viruses, and it's the influenza virus that caused the last um, global pandemic in 1918. So positive sense, what does that mean? Positive sense means that in simple terms that this viral RNA can be translated by our host cells, so the human cells, into proteins. Um, and then finally, SARS is in the family of coronaviruses. 
that's a set of viruses. There are other human coronaviruses that cause things like the common cold, but that's not the same thing as SARS-CoV-2. There's also um, the first SARS and then MERS, which is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. Those are both coronaviruses that are zoonotic diseases, um, which means that they spill over from two humans from animals. And people in my field of disease ecology have long been worried about coronaviruses of pandemic potential spilling over from bats into humans because bats are major hosts of coronaviruses and bats and humans have a lot of niche overlap. We live in a lot, a lot of the same environments. So let's talk about the genome. The, a genome is an organism's genetic material. It's the instruction manual for how to make and maintain that organism. You might also think of it as the string of letters, U, A, G, C, um, and those are the nucleobases. And the genome has genes in it, and those determine the phenotype. This word phenotype means the functions and appearance of an organism. So the genotype interacts with the environment to create the phenotype. And this string of letters is translated into amino acids. So if this is a strand of RNA, each one of these colors represents a nucleobase. And three letters get translated into um, amino acids. So for example, UUU and UUC both will code for the amino acid of phenylalanine. And those amino acids, here are the abbreviated here, string together into proteins, and those proteins fold onto each other through chemical reactions until they have this structure, and, this, and they become proteins, and proteins are what do stuff. And the viral proteins do bad stuff to our bodies. So, the whole genome of SARS-CoV-2 is about 3, 30,000 bases, and that's compared to three, more than 3 billion base pairs for humans. So it is a large viral genome, but compared to the human genome, it's not that big. So the whole human, or the whole genome sequence of SARS-CoV-2, and that is, that, what that means is the exact letters in the strand of RNA that makes up the virus can be quickly generated from a sample. So we can figure out what that genome is from a sample. And in the last 20 years, the capabilities to sequence whole genomes have greatly increased. So they're faster, they're cheaper, they're more reliable. And you might think of it as the difference between a cell phone from 1990 and a cell phone from today, so with the iPhone 13 or whatever number they're on now and the capabilities that are possible. So this whole genome sequencing is very, very important to understanding evolution of variants. So this super fast sequencing makes it possible to sequence samples from around the world and do genomic epidemiology. And global sharing of data is key to this tracking and understanding of variants. This screenshot is from the Jusade website which is worth perusing if you ever have the chance, it's jusade.org. And that stands for Global Initiative on Sharing All Influenza Data. The Jusade platform was created in 2008 by the World Health Assembly, or on the occasion of the 61st World Health Assembly. And it's a publicly accessible database designed by scientists for scientists to share um, data about influenza, but it has been used to share data about SAR, the, the SARS-CoV-2 genomic data during the current pandemic. When I checked on Monday, there were over 2 million submissions of sequences into this database. And I can't emphasize enough how important this global sharing and cooperation of um, sharing data and genomic data is. Without that, we could not know what we do know about evolution of variants, and we can't track those variants as they spread around the world. So this website is called nextstrain.org. It's also another one that I highly recommend perusing if you get the chance. It uses the GSA data. 
So on the x-axis here is time. So you'll see um, this is the original virus emerging out of Wuhan at, in late 2019. And this is June 2021. That was when I took the screenshot of this. Um, so the x-axis here is time. And if you hover over a data point, you will get, um, you can see what mutations there are. For example, this one has C5184T mutation. That means a C is now is, um, in place of T at the position 5184 of the genome. It also has things like the inferred date of when that variant would have arised, would have arisen, and the confidence interval. So here, that probably arose between November 8th, 2020, and February 28th, 2021. And then you can zoom into a clade. And in biology, what a clade means is it's an ancestor and all of its descendants. So kind of a grouping like this. And I think it might be helpful to talk a little bit about how to read a phylogeny. And I put the next strain um, screenshot up here for reference. At the back of a phylogeny, you've got the root. That is the ancestor of all of the descendants here. And here, you've got the present day species. And in the next strain, because we're talking about a virus, these are strains of the virus. So these would be the ones that are in circulation today. So the far right are the strains in circulation today. And when you get to a node or a branch point, what that means is that the virus has changed significantly enough that it's a, you would consider it a new strain. It is significantly different from its ancestors. So we can go back to this nextstrain.org website and look at these new variants as they arise. So here's the original virus emerging from Wuhan. You probably heard of the beta variant and the alpha variant. So this alpha variant arose around here and it didn't really become a problem until um, earlier this year. We've got the beta variant. Um, so the alpha variant, there are different nomenclatures for how you name a virus. Recently, the World Health Organization has converged on a naming system that uses um, Greek, so alpha, beta, theta, delta, but there are other conventions. So you might have also heard of that variant as the B117 variant or the UK variant. Um, and it's important, I think, to not call a variant necessarily by the name where it arose because that stigmatizes a location in a way that I think is not very fair. So this next, that's how we track evolution of variants. Um, the next question that I'd like to answer is what is a variant of concern? So the variant has, what it means to be a variant is that it has genetic changes that alter an important trait. And having to be of concern is it alters a trait that we care about. And the traits that we tend to track are infectivity, which is the ability of that pathogen to establish an infection, transmissibility, which is the ability of that pathogen to pass from one host to another. And that's probably what you've been hearing in the news this week about the Delta variant being highly transmissible. That's the trait they're talking about. Virulence is the pathogen's ability to cause damage to the host. And one weird thing about SARS-CoV-2 is that there's a great variation in the virulence of pathogens when they get into different humans. Another trait that we care about is antigenicity. And that means how well the antigen, and the antigen is part of the virus that the immune system recognizes. So we've got immune cells, which are B cells. You might've heard of that as antibodies. And then you've got T cells. So that is your immune system attaching to the antigen to neutralize the virus or kill an infected cell. So we wanna know uh, how well does that part of the virus bind to the immune cells that might have induced, been induced by a previous infection or by vaccination? So this next main idea is how, how does it work? How do evolution, how does evolution of variants work? 
biological evolution, to define it in simple terms, it's a heritable change in one or more characteristics of a population of a species across many generations. So some important things here are heritable. So heritable means that it, be, it has to have a genetic basis and able to be passed down from parent to offspring and across many generations. So that means a single virion or virus isn't evolving, a person's not evolving, populations evolve. It's a change in the characteristics within a population. So there are many different ways that evolution can happen, but the one I want to talk about today is evolution by natural selection. And this is often a misconception of, of students that natural selection and evolution are the same thing, which isn't, which isn't quite true. Natural selection is just one mechanism of evolution, and it's the one that you um, probably have heard about the most. And what it means is that individuals with heritable traits that give them a survival or reproduction advantage will reproduce more. And because of that, the advantageous traits will increase in frequency and the disadvantageous traits will decrease in frequency. One caveat to that is that organisms are, have multiple traits and selection doesn't just select, doesn't have a bin of different traits and you get to select the best trait from each one. An organism is multiple traits. So you might have a highly advantageous trait and a disadvantaged, disadvantageous trait in the same organism. So that means that a disadvantageous trait may not disappear just because it's disadvantageous. Here's a cartoon that kind of explains it. Um, we've got some birds here and they're eating beetles and beetle color is the trait of interest. We've got green beetles and brown beetles. So take note of what color of beetle the bird is eating. Because I'm going to show you a slide next. And then also take note of what color, what the relative frequency of relative proportion of the green and the brown beetles are. So over generations, we see that the birds, they're still eating those green beetles, but look at what's happened to the proportion of green to brown beetles. Being green is disadvantageous for survival. Being brown is advantageous for survival. So you see the relative proportion of green go down and the relative proportion of brown go up. And over time, many, many generations later, most or all of them are brown here and that's what's called fixation and most traits don't go to fixation and that you only see that um, from now on but that's in a nutshell how evolution by natural selection works one important thing to consider is variation in order for there to be selection there has to be variation so if you go into your refrigerator and all you have is peanut butter that's all you get to eat. If you've got peanut butter and you've got um, bologna and you have other things, that you, apples, then there is selection. So in order for selection, there has to be variation. But variation is actually a really interesting concept that is studied a lot in science education research. Science education research tells us about how people think about variation. And I picked out two important concepts. One is that people tend to notice central tendency rather than variation, especially for non-human species. What that means is they notice this, the essential characteristics, sometimes it's called essentialism, but they don't notice variation within those characteristics. Another important thing about how people think about variation is that they tend to notice and place more importance on outward variation than on variation we can't see. For example, um, color. Color might be an outward variation that you can see, but maybe what's actually of more importance to that organism is a protein, somewhere regulating something. So I just put two images up here. This is the coronavirus with the spike protein. This is a really common image you see in popular media and social media whenever they show pictures of coronavirus. And this is the spike protein um, from the work of Bing Chen, who's at Boston Children's Hospital. What I want you to do 
is pretend that you're looking at the spot the differences from a highlight magazine or something if you ever played ever did that and see if you can see the differences here in this protein. And I know we're not interacting. Maybe if I can see people's faces. But I can't. Um, yeah, this region here is a little more, has a bit more red in it, which may be a really simple change, a really simple mutation, but it has implications for function, like how well that spike protein might attach to a receptor cell in a human. In talking with my own family and friends, I realized one thing in that, and part of it may be with depictions, part of it is how people think about variation. That in my, my friends and family just thought the spike protein was the spike protein and there were no differences. And that wasn't something that was changing, but it really is. It's a big spot of evolution. So how does variation arise? The ultimate source is mutation. And mutation simply means it's a change in the sequence of the nucleotides in the genome. So if we've got those four bases, a, T, um, G, U, the, the basis of the genome, a change in one of those, a substitution, a duplication, um, that's a mutation. And science research tells us, so science education research tells us a lot about how people think about mutations. People tend to think all mutations are bad. Mutation just sounds like a bad word. People think mutations are rare. And people think mutations happen in a lone individual, and then they spread from there. And I like to call that the lone mutant. Um, I find this a lot with my students. But in reality, mutations can be good, bad, or neutral. One other common um, incorrect way to think about it, or incorrect thinking, is that people tend to not know what they're talking about which, whether they're talking about the pathogen or the host, which species they're talking about when they talk about good, bad, or neutral. So when we're talking about it, we're thinking about good, bad, or neutral for the virus, not the human host. So good is a mutation that would make the virus able to survive and reproduce more. So something that made it more transmissible. Bad is something that makes the virus less able to survive. And bad mutations generally don't increase in the population. And you, you've got neutral mutations, and those don't change the phenotype. That is the, the outward expression uh, or the inward expression um, of the virus in a way that affects its fitness. And fitness in biological terms means the ability to survive and reproduce. So we've got many different types of mutations, and lots of mutations are neutral. One way we know whether something's being selected against, whether a mutation is being selected, increasing in frequency, is to compare a neutral uh, mutation with the rate of increase of a good mutation. Vi or mutations are not really rare when you think about it. And mutations, the same mutation is going to occur more than once, generally, especially in a small genome like this. And uh, we call that convergent evolution. And in this diagram, it's also a lineage diagram like I showed you before, it's just oriented differently. So we've got the root of the pandemic, the original virus in humans, and then the different lineages that are coming off of it. So this European lineage, um, and we have different mutations. So the E484K, that's associated with antibody resistance the N501Y mutation, which is associated with increased transmissibility. So this would make them make it easier for a virus, for the virus to evade maybe a vaccine or a previous infection. This one makes the virus spread faster. So what we see, let's first take this, um, this E484K mutation, which is signified by this red box you'll see that here we have the ancestor. The ancestor does not have the mutation. And you've got many different lineages coming off from there. And that red box independently arises here, here, and then, then we've got these other, other lineages. It, ar it arose here, it arose here. Once the lineage is in existence, it could be passed on. 
So here, this B1128, that lineage moved on, um, diverged into P1 and P2, and you see this red mutation is conserved in those different lineages. And you'll see this uh, N501Y mutation, which is this uh, teal colored box. You see it independently arising here, here, and here, and here. And this lineage, or this variant, has both of those two mutations. So the same mutation is going to occur more than once. Sometimes people think that the only way that you can have a mutation in one place and in another place means that there's flow of people between that, between those two places. Yes, that is true, but convergent evolution is also important. Um, the conditions for variants to arise are something you really have to think about because organisms, including viruses, evolve in response to selection pressures in their environment. And a selection pressure is whatever's doing the selecting for or against a trait. Um, and the environment of a pathogen is a host. So let's think about all these different hosts for the coronavirus. We have what we think is the original host of the coronavirus, which is um, probably in a horseshoe bat lineage. The, the, the horseshoe bat has different ACE receptors. It's got a different kind of immune system. And when the pathogen was in there, it was evolving in response to the horseshoe bat. Then we have, as soon as the virus emerged in people, humans have a different kind of immune system. And early on, we had no vaccine. So the selection pressures of a human that's been infected versus a human that hasn't been infected and doesn't have immunity or secondary immunity, T cells, B cells, those are different selection pressures. One thing people tend to discount is the idea that SARS-CoV-2 is a multi-host pathogen. It can, it can infect and be transmitted from many, many different species. And you might have heard about mink. So last year, there were in, in Sweden and Denmark, there were lots of mink farms where the mink were infected from human SARS-CoV-2. And um, that immune system of the mink is different than the human system. So this is another spot where evolution, where selection pressures could happen. And many individual, many humans were infected with the mink strain. So there was evolution in the mink and then that was passed on to humans. One, um, one thought that people tend to have are what happens when the virus is harbored by someone who is an immunocompromised and they don't clear the infection very quickly. So that means that virus is replicating and replicating and replicating within that immunocompromised person. And there's a high chance for um, evolution or mutation to occur. So every time there's replication, there can be mutation. Another thing to think about is now people are getting vaccinated. So this woman is being vaccinated for coronavirus and a vaccine, a person with a vaccine has a different immune landscape compared to someone who's not vaccinated or compared to the population when, of humans when the pandemic first started. So that puts up another bit of um, selection pressures against the virus. So why does all this matter in terms of what we can do to save lives and end the pandemic? And another question people have a lot is how will evolution of variants affect vaccine efficacy? So the more the virus replicates, the more chance there are for mutations that affect the phenotype. That means how that virus acts. So every time you copy something, think to yourself, like if you were to copy a list of 30,000 letters and then take that copy and copy the list of 30,000 letters and do it again and again, um, there would be errors. So the more the virus replicates, the more chance there are for mutations that affect the phenotype. And the greater the vaccination rates, that means the less viral replication there will be. So the less environments, the fewer people there will be where that virus can replicate and change. And that means that there will be fewer mutations. So widespread vaccination reduces the chance that vaccine resistant or drug resistant strains will arise 
one common misconception that I hear in popular media is that, well, the vaccine's not working, so why should I get it? But the reason the vaccine isn't working is because enough people aren't getting it and there's mutation outside. So that people tend to think they don't see that variation. They don't see that the virus that emerged in fall 2019 is not the same virus in circulation today. And it won't be the same virus that's in circulation a month from now. So what can we do and what are we doing? One, we can increase vaccination all over the globe. We talk, I talked a little bit about gene flow and that, that means that a variant from one place that arises in one place will inevitably go across the globe. So what happens somewhere else really matters to the entire, to the entire planet. So what, what happened with the Delta variant arising in India, it is now all over the world. We can also do lots of studies about how the different variants respond to monoclonal and poly polyclonal antibodies. What that means is those antibodies are what's produced in response to infection or to vaccination. Monoclonal antibodies, you might have heard of those as um, a treatment that gets injected, artificial monoclonal antibodies. Um, polyclonal antibodies are multiple antibodies, so poly. And what, what happens is you try, you test that, that variant in a serum of polyclonal or monoclonal antibodies and see what happens. And then you can kind of guess, you can have data about how will this mutation affect um, antibodies from the vaccine. We can also examine specific mutations singly and in different combinations and see how do they affect the form and function of the virus. So we can look at how does it change the structure of that spike protein, for example. And it's not just um, important to look at a mutation on its own. You also want to look at how different combinations of, of mutations affect the ultimate phenotype of the whole organism. And then finally, we can continue to surveil and share data from around the globe to detect those variants as they emerge. And I can't really stress enough like how important GIS-AID is in this global co cooperation, how important that really is. And also how important it is that this pandemic arose at a time when whole genome sequencing had gotten so much faster, so much cheaper, so much easier. Um, so I think that's super duper important. And with that, I guess I'll take some questions. And Marjorie, should I stop my share? Um, sure, if you want to, we can see people okay. if they want to join in. Um, that was really, really interesting. <laughs> I learned a lot. Um, can I ask you, start off with a really yeah. ignorant question about, yeah. <clears throat> about evolution? Mm -hmm. um, with your beetle example. Yes. Um, I wondered, about what happened to the birds who preferred the green beetles, right? I mean, once the green beetles are gone, yeah, okay. Evolutionarily, mm -hmm. um, what happens to the species who prefer the the thing that disappears? Right. So often, what happens is well, that's called that example. If I kept going with it, it could be example of what we call frequency dependent selection. So the birds that liked the orange would then be Strong. eating would would then survive and the ones that wouldn't eat anything but green would not survive and so that it's also called co-evolution that was what i anticipated but i just yeah. kind of wonder um the what was the website um kevin asked next yes it's next yeah. strain.org and the other one was gisaid.org uh -huh. yeah, yeah. I can put that one. I just did. Marjorie did. Okay. Yeah. So, any uh, questions or comments? You can either put them in the chat or raise your hand. I know that was a lot of biology and it's not easy stuff. Um, Okay. So should we worry about all these variants if we're fully vaccinated? Yes. 
I, I would. I do. Personally, I do worry about the variants um, if we're fully vaccinated. And one thing is um, eventually there will be some variants that escape the immune response that comes from being vaccinated. Um, yeah, I know. It, well, I mean, you just have to track. I would track the incidence of disease where you're living or where, where you are. And so it's kind of context dependent. In Colorado, we're doing a really good job of vaccination and we have um, fairly low rates compared to of infection compared to other locations around the planet and even in the US. So track it. If, if disease incidence goes up, I would still wear, I still wear a mask when I go to many places, crowded places. Um, but, and the other thing is there's a lot of research, many, many people, are doing work to see how these variants respond to antibodies um, and immune cells generated by the vaccines. Unfortunately, there was an article published in Science Magazine uh, last week showing that there, there is a variant that's escaping the mRNA vaccine, at least antibodies generated by that vaccine. All right, so I mean, that's really interesting because I, I feel like the media in general is saying the vaccines are covering the Delta variant, right? I mean, that that seems to be the, yeah. is that true? And the, it's more um, the concern for other variants that will develop? The vaccine is doing a decent job with the Delta variant, but the, the efficacy I think is a little bit lower than it would have been, than it is for the original variant for which that vaccine, from which that vaccine was designed. Right. But when we compare that to the efficacy of vaccines of yesterday, um, like the, the, those mRNA vaccines have um, remarkable, remarkable efficacy. So going down a little bit still is better than some of the other vaccines we have for different, different pathogens. Right, and the message is still obviously get a vaccine. Yeah, mm -hmm. I believe so, yes. Yes. I mean, there are some people who can't, and that's a medical reason. But. Other questions or comments? It was an awful lot in this talk. I would think we could I, generate a good conversation. Hopefully I didn't overdo it, do it. No, no. waiting for somebody to jump in. Okay. Oh, all right. So I see a, a question from Mitch. Um, other forms of evolution. So um, mutation is one form of evolution. Gene flow. So if we're just talking about one population, one way that you can get new variation in a population is through mutation. Another is through selection. So after that mutation occurs, you get selection. Um, another way is gene flow. And that means that other individuals come into the population and change the makeup of that population. So when people came from other places that had different variants, they were bringing in um, new, bringing in variants into the gene pool of the coronavirus that we had circulating here in Colorado, for example. That Delta variant did not originate here, but it's here now through something called gene flow. There's non-random mating, which is not, um, uh, not something you would deal with with a virus, but when individuals preferentially meet with, with individuals that have certain traits. Great. We have a couple of questions now. What are the medical reasons a person would not get the vaccine? Oh, okay. So things like um, they might have an uh, uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, they may have had an adverse reaction to a similar vaccine. So if you had a really bad reaction to your first shot, your doctor may tell you not to get that, that second shot. But from what I'm hearing, um, people with autoimmune diseases like uh, um, rheumatoid arthritis, like they're still recommended to get the vaccine, cancer patients, pregnant women, um, women who are lactating. Um, they are, they're recommended too. I, I believe so. Yes, yeah. they are. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so CU, this is right, CU seems to feel that we are safe too, since no masks are required as of August 1st. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a good idea knowing about developing variants? Um, I think it's about a couple of things to consider. One, how much virus is circulating in, in your community at any one time. So what are the chances that you're going to encounter someone who has the pathogen and can give it to you? The other thing, if we've got very low rates of disease, then I think it's okay to, to not, having, not have masks. But if you start to increase above a threshold um, and have a lot of circulation, then I, I would wear a mask again. And the variants, um, the variants are concerning, I, I think. And if a variant of concern um, comes in and there's high incidence, then I hope that the university would respond to that. And I think, I think we would. I've, I've been really pleased with how the university has made decisions and handled things. Like they're in line with what I would think of as an infectious disease ecologist. Um, when you say escape vaccine, do you mean infection or yeah. illness? Mm -hmm. or is that yeah, those are, those are um, important distinctions. So the vaccine could prevent against severe disease. And that's really the most important thing that we care about is um, escaping severe disease. But um, it all escape vaccine escape could also mean just um, you get infected, but it, it's not serious. Or it could be you get infected and it gets serious. If if the vaccine um, escape affects both of those characteristics, that's super important. Okay. Other questions? There we go. I'll, I'll read that one. You'll read that one. Mm -hmm. We'll read it out for everybody. As someone who studies biology, I've noticed that cell biology is fairly straightforward besides some of the terms. Is there a difficulty with accounting for medical advancements for anything because of the small size of cells and the contents within them? If not, what is the difficulty of advancements, including vaccination? I'm not sure I told, I'm not sure I understand. Um, what, Carl, would you mind clarifying a bit more? Yeah. Um... I'll just unmute because it would probably be a little oh, easier. Sure. Uh -huh. um, so I've been getting into cell biology and I'm, I'm sure there's more complex things than what we're learning about. But um, like neurodegenerative diseases seem simple in that it's just protein misfolding. But you look at the actual medical field and a lot of neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's, dementia, things like that, they're uncurable at this point. So I was wondering what that gap is between knowing what's wrong with something and like vaccinations, it could be anything, mm -hmm. but actually being able to implement that information to make it so there is no all time. Uh, okay. Yeah. Whatever. I think I understand what you mean. Um, I like to think of this in science education and in science research, the idea of like understanding a phenomenon versus understanding the mechanism that controls that phenomenon. So we may know that something folds this way, but we may not have the best, we may not totally understand the mechanism by which that happened. And mechanisms I think are a lot harder to get at than just knowing the phenomenon of something. For example, um, for virulence of, a, of, a, of the pathogen or transmissibility of the, of the pathogen, on nextstrain.org, we could maybe see like that variant is increasing in frequency in the population at a great rate. So that's a phenomenon. We say that that, that pathogen is more transmissible, um, but we may not really understand how it's more transmissible. So the how part, I think is just a more difficult question, partly because you can look at something in isolation, um, but sometimes what you look at in isolation isn't enough without looking at it in the context in which it occurs. So though marrying those two things, isolating and understanding, and then understanding within a context, that's difficult to do. Um, and I think sometimes we, we think that labs can figure things out and everything always works, but that's not always the case. Like sometimes I, I saw a cartoon about microbiologists and it was, um, it's, 
it's very, very hard to culture some things, like to get them to grow when you want them to grow. And I'm, like, even with my own garden, like if I want it to live, it dies. If I want it to die, it lives. Um, so things, especially when you're working with live organisms, they don't always do what you think they're gonna do. That's me and houseplants. Yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> All right. Okay. I studied plague and I couldn't, the colonies of prairie dogs that I, that I needed to stay that I was trying to study, they kept getting, that some would get plague when I didn't want them to get plague. And then the ones that I wanted to get plague didn't get plague, so. Anything else? was great. Thank you so much, Dr. Hartley, Laurel. Um, I found it really, really interesting. You're welcome. Thank you for attending. Um, next week, uh, Jennifer Reich from Sociology will be speaking to us about vaccines. So I hope to see you then. Um, and enjoy your week. <laughs>